and we'll move on to Emil Brunner on page uh, 109. So Emil, <coughs> excuse me. So Emil Brunner died in 1966. Um, top of 110, disciple of Bart. Uh, there was a battle between Bart and Brunner at one time. I'll mention to you. Uh, but uh, Brunner always said that he was a Bartian, that he was a follower of Bart. Um, even toward the end of his life, he said that. He said, I've always been a Bartian. But uh, Brunner is a little bit different from Bart, at least in, the, uh, in what he emphasizes his uh, typical uh, major themes. The major theme for Brunner is personalism, and he gets this from from Ebner and uh, Oman and Martin Buber and various existentialists, and also from people like uh, Wilhelm Hermann, who we talked about earlier uh, in this course. Uh, person, personalism. God is a person, I am a person. And uh, our relationship is personal, and, and Brunner hammered at that over and over again in all kinds of different ways. Uh, Brunner was initially more influential than Bart was in the English-speaking world because Brunner studied in England and uh, in Union Seminary of New York, and he taught for a while at Princeton Seminary, and uh, he taught in Japan for a couple of years. So uh, he was more of a world traveler. Bart was kind of a stay-at-home. There was a very famous uh, trip that uh, Bart took uh, toward the end of his life where he spoke at uh, Princeton and various places in the U.S. Uh, but uh, Bruner was uh, already known in all these places, a world traveler and uh, appreciated in many circles of the church. Um, Bruner, I think, tends to... Uh, I, I think Bruner is less profound as a thinker. I think Bruner is probably less intelligent than Bard, although it's hard to make those kinds of judgments. Look on page 110, what Bruner says about God. God is an absolute person. He is therefore a subject and never an object, all right? Uh, God is personal. That's, that's Bruner's uh, regular theme. And therefore, he's so personal that he's, he's, he's always the subject of knowledge, never an object of knowledge. Uh, you can't really uh, know him. Uh, strictly speaking, God cannot be thought of because Bruner says what man thinks he masters. I mean, there's that Bartian theme of uh, uh, possessing and controlling and manipulating and so on. And Bruner picks this up. If we could think about God, then we would be mastering God. So God is utterly free uh, and his righteousness is subordinate to his freedom. He's wholly other. He's not the God of the philosophers, and so on. So he, he masters this transcendence view, um, wholly other, wholly hidden, that we found in Bard. On the other hand, there's also a doctrine of immanence in Brunner, as there's a doctrine of immanence in Bard. Uh, God's essence is revelation. Uh, he is by nature, since he's a person, he's by nature someone who reveals himself persons uh, talk to other persons, persons reveal themselves to other persons, and so God does that too. So paradoxically, even though God is unknowable, we can know him. <laughs> See why these neo-Orthodox uh, theologians were uh, thought to be theologians of paradox or theologians of, uh, of the absurd sometimes. Uh, well, so we, we can't know God, but we can know God. Uh, Brunner develops a revelational view of the Trinity, kind of like Barthes, uh, but uh, revelation is always a revelation of a mystery, so no matter how much God reveals himself, he's still unrevealed. Uh, no matter how much God reveals himself, he's still transcendent. Uh, God's attributes, uh, paradoxical but uh, complementary, uh, holiness and love, Holiness being his transcendence, love being his imminence, uh, wrath and mercy. Uh, God is the source of law, but he stands over and against it. Now, Bruner's view of revelation is uh, a personal encounter between uh, a, per a human being and God. 
So uh, now personal relationships, according to Bruner, are very different from impersonal relationships. The personal relationship he calls I thou. I thou, following Martin Buber, who wrote a book called I thou, uh, I am thou. Uh, Bruner, a personal relationship is an I thou relationship. An impersonal relationship is an I it relationship. So my relationship, uh, the relationship between me and this marker that I'm holding up is uh, impersonal. It's an I-it relationship. Uh, my relationship with my wife is a person-to-person -person relationship, an I-thou relationship. Now, of course, if I started taking my wife for granted and started treating her uh, harshly and, and without love, uh, then uh, my relationship with her would become more and more like an I-it relationship. So you can have an I-it relationship with a person, although you really shouldn't. And if I came to the point where I really love this magic marker, uh, just like some people love trees and some people love mountains and scenery, uh, then, uh, of course, uh, that would become more like an I-thou relationship. So you can have an I-thou relationship with a tree. But basically, the, there's a vast difference between these two kinds of relationship. And uh, with God, your relationship has to be an I-thou relationship. You cannot treat him as an impersonal uh, object. You can't treat God as a thing. You can only treat God uh, as a, a person. So uh, I, in a personal relationship, uh, Bruner, uh, and here I think he, he's, he's exaggerating, but he says in a personal relationship, I cannot contemplate or master the other. I can only speak to him, not about him. Is that really so? Would you say that you can't speak about your wife? Would you say that when you speak about your wife that you're impersonalizing her? I don't think so. Um, um, and, and he thinks that you can't contemplate. I mean, you can't think about someone without turning them into a, a thing. I, I don't think that's right. I think for the most part, when I, when I think about somebody, I, I, uh, that improves my personal relationship with the other person. I mean, uh, think about uh, somebody who's doing research on uh, President Obama. And uh, he may know all kinds of facts about President Obama, but he doesn't know President Obama as a friend. Uh, then the White House gardener, who sees President Obama every day, uh, might not know nearly as many facts about him, but uh, at least uh, he might be able to say, I, I know him as a friend. He's a friend of mine. So there are different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of knowing uh, persons, some of them uh, tend to depersonalize, others don't. But uh, often, you know, when, when I meet somebody and I think, well, wouldn't it be nice to be a friend of this person? And I go off and I try, I Google that person, try to learn a few facts about him. A lot of the time, those facts improve the, the friendship. Those facts are good for the friendship. Those facts deepen the friendship. Sometimes they're not. I mean, if I discover the other person is a horse thief that I might not want to be friends with them. But uh, uh, you, you can't generalize and say that, uh, that when you know facts about somebody, uh, you're, you're depersonalizing them. You can't be a friend. That's certainly not true with God. I mean, God reveals all kinds of facts about himself. Uh, he's the creator of heaven and earth. He's, he's mighty to save. He's uh, uh, powerful. He's all-knowing and so on. And to know those things is, is to know more and more about your friend. And uh, having that kind of knowledge doesn't uh, uh, in itself decrease the friendship, but uh, deepens the friendship. Well, uh, but, but Bruner has this peculiar view that knowing propositions, you know, the word proposition is a difficult word for these liberal theologians, uh, knowing propositions about God is always depersonalizing somehow. Uh, so the, he says uh, under, under 1C, formulation of doctrinal propositions 
always involves a turning away from the original revelation. The words can never capture the revelation adequately. Uh, God's revelation is always indirect, always veiled. But nevertheless, revelation is God himself, as Barth says. Uh, on top of 111, revelation is always in the present. Uh, it's never located in the past. Revelation is always uh, for me. It always involves a response. Uh, for me, I never have revelation apart from response. Well, uh, so you can see similarities to Bart, but a little difference in emphasis. Under D, the forms of revelation for Bruner. First, uh, Bruner believes in God's revelation in nature. Now, this was the famous debate between Bart and Bruner. There was a famous controversy. Bruner wrote a, a kind of an inconsequential little book called Natural Theology, uh, where he said something that's, that's not terribly, uh, terribly untraditional, that God reveals himself in the natural world, and he cites Psalm 19.1 and so on and so forth. Uh, Bruner never guessed what would happen, the explosion that would come afterward. Here comes Bart uh, publishing a reply to Bruner's book, and Bart's reply is simply called Nine, which translates no. Again, it's as if a bombshell went off in the playground. This time it was Bruner's playground. Uh, Bruner uh, holds that despite sin... A fallen man has some ability to understand the revelation of God in nature and in the human heart. Bart argues no. He says uh, uh, that uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, we have the capacity to understand God is to say that we have, there's a point of contact in human nature between God and ourselves. And that means that... Uh, uh, God's freedom is limited. Uh, God, uh, God's revelation does not come entirely by grace. God's, uh, God's revelation presupposes something in me, and that can never be. So Bart says there is no natural theology. Bart says that God does not uh, reveal himself uh, uh, using a point of contact in natural theology. God creates his own point of contact. When God wants to reveal himself uh, to me, he, he creates in me the ability to understand that, and it doesn't come through natural revelation or natural theology. Well, uh, uh, Bruner didn't know quite what to make of that. There was a certain amount of dialogue and debate between them, but uh, uh, anyway, that's... Uh, uh, something that uh, belongs to uh, the history of doctrine. Uh, besides nature, Bruner acknowledged that God revealed himself in history. How does this stack up against Lessing's ditch? Well, let's see here. Number two, history. Bruner says that faith rests upon objective events that took place 2,000 years ago. So Bruner affirms the importance of the historical Jesus over against historical relativism. But, of course, he says, we know these events only by the revelation of God, and we only know them in the present by faith. So historical criticism is no barrier to us. It creates no problems for faith. And Bruner uh, tends to be more skeptical than Bart about miracles, the virgin birth, the resurrection, and so on. He says that questions could even be raised about Jesus' historical existence. So he starts off with a rhetoric that sounds like he's going to make, make more of history, more of calendar history than Bart did. But he ends up saying that, uh, uh, you know, everything we know historically is questionable. And uh, the only way we can know anything at all about uh, uh, Jesus' uh, work on our behalf is through faith. So th this is really the same distinction that Bart makes between Geschichte and history, but it's put in a little bit different language. 
Uh, now, Bruner's view of Scripture, again, he speaks of Scripture as witness and instrument. Uh, scripture is a witness to God. Scripture is not itself revelation. It points away from itself to Christ. It is the crib in which the, our Savior uh, rested when uh, he was born. Uh, but it is a normative witness because historically it is the primary source of witness. It's a human, wor human word about a divine word. Besides being witness, it is also instrument. Remember those two terms. Those are important for the neo-Orthodox view of Scripture. Scripture is witness and instrument. And just as it's a witness to revelation in the past, so it's an instrument of revelation in the present. It brings God's word to me in the moment of faith. So God uh, condescends to speak words. Um, but one wonders if that uh, diminishes the personalism of this encounter. Evidently, uh, so. but anyway, Bruder is not at all... Um, hesitant to say what he doesn't believe. Um, his positive view of Scripture is a little bit hard to follow, but uh, Bruner is quite clear as to what he doesn't believe. He doesn't believe in the orthodox doctrine of verbal inspiration. And Bart didn't believe it either, but Bart said some complimentary things about it. Bart said that uh, if he had to choose between verbal inspiration and liberalism, he'd choose verbal inspiration. Now, Bruner doesn't even say that. Uh, he simply denies the orthodox view of verbal inspiration. And by the way, verbal inspiration only means that God has inspired the words of Scripture, not uh, just the thoughts of the authors. The actual words of Scripture are God's word. Well, uh, uh, Bart didn't believe that, and Bruner doesn't believe it either, uh, even though he... he wants to be as biblical as possible within those limits. He says that verbal inspiration is idolatry. It's faith in a book, faith in a law rather than faith in Christ. Now, Bruner uh, admits that the doctrine of verbal inspiration does have a biblical basis. In other words, it's part of what, Bibli what the Bible teaches about itself. Many neo-Orthodox theologians, including Bard, I think, would say that the Bible itself does not teach verbal inspiration. Uh, but Bruner here says the Bible does teach verbal inspiration. He finds it in 2 Timothy 3.16, and he finds it in the doctrine of prophecy in the Old Testament. But, uh, so what does he do with that? Well, he basically says we don't need to believe 2 Timothy 3.16, and we don't need to believe the doctrine of prophecy in the Old Testament. Uh, he says that uh, the uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 is late, um, may not have been written by an apostle, and this passage is inconsistent with what he calls more antinomian strains uh, in the New Testament, uh, other parts of the New Testament. And he points out that the New Testament use of the old is sometimes allegorical, which, uh, of course, uh, uh, would make their view very different from uh, that of uh, orthodox theology. So he's very strongly in favor of higher criticism, and therefore uh, he tells us that Scripture has no special wisdom on matters of science or history. Um, he also polemicizes against what he calls uniform inspiration. That is the idea that all parts of Scripture are uh, always and equally uh, inspired. And he polemicizes against uh, orthodoxy in general with a rather bitter tone. He says that, uh, I, I suspect that he probably had a hard time personally with some fundamentalists or some evangelicals who, who uh, uh, attacked him. But anyway, he says some nasty things. He, he gives as good as he takes, at least. Um, says some nasty things about evangelicals, that they're motivated by fear, that they lack a sense of fellowship, that they lack spiritual power, that they lack missionary zeal. Um, very uh, kind of a bitter flavor to uh, uh, 
uh, Bruner's uh, attack on verbal inspiration. 